Hi, welcome to The Property Show. I'm Jayashri Kuro from Editor MBTV. And we're talking about a, a, a policy change that kind of slithered in without many people noticing it. We were all talking about the farmer's bill and the agitation and there was so much noise that people forgot that there was one small uh, bill that got passed that allowed netting. Now, what netting is, how it impacts the market, we'll go to Kuldeep. But before that, let me introduce my panelists. There's Kuldeep Chavla, he's CFO of the Puravankara Group, a veteran in the uh, finance industry in lending, and he knows the ins and outs of the market much better than many other people I know. There's Veena Shivaramakrishnan, she's partner Shardur Amarchand Amar Mangaldas and Company. Shobhit Agarwal, he's MD and CEO, and a rock actor. So, uh, Kuldeep, over to you. What is the significance of this one, one small act? And is it, is it one in the series of uh, changes that happened to prepare India for a bonds market? So let me start with your last bit of the question first. I think the short answer and the expectation is that yes, this is you know, one amongst the many important steps uh, that should, you know, and we hope would sooner rather than later lead to a more deep, broad-based and efficient bond market, not just for the sector we're going to talk about today, but for the broader Indian economy, you know. Um, and I'll come back to that. I think the government has been kind of, you know, progressively taking step by step. I think there are, you know, some issues both that the RBI, who is the custodian of, of currency in that sense that, you know, needs to resolve. But I think the regulator, whether it's the RBI, SEBI, or indeed Finance Ministry, Government of India, have been making certain steps that I think are in the right direction. Uh, you know, we've had setbacks, including but not limited to uh, two years ago when the uh, NBFC crisis kind of happened because of the subsidiaries of, of Ireland FS. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. The first part of your question, though, uh, talked about what is netting at a very simplistic level. Netting is something, let me, let me explain that with an example. If I, as a capital provider, have with a party X, a positive position of, let's say, 100, and I have a negative position with the same party of 75, what was happening hitherto is that I needed to provide capital for 175, right? Um, I won't complicate the issue with derivatives and so on and so forth, but at a very simplistic level, you know, for the benefit of your of the audience, now we need to provide capital for 25, right? right? That makes the market much more uh, efficient. I think it's also a good step or, or, or an important step towards moving to an international settlement solution because that's the way the international market works. Yes. Because today we have NSDL and I think if we recognize the fact that you know, uh, the sector, is, you know, is capital intensive and needs money. And we recognize the fact that, glo you know, global capital markets and global debt capital markets can help us address the issue. Then I think we need to take those kind of steps. So in summary, it spurs the bond market. It is a step in the right direction. Maybe in fact, moving India, I would say one step closer to the global debt index. Yeah. Uh, and it decreases the amount of capital and makes it more efficient. Correct. Uh, Shobit, the real estate industry, we, uh, uh, the bonds market is not exclusively for the uh, real estate industry, but it, real estate is one large part of that uh, entire uh, macrocosm. So let's, let's talk about the real estate market and the kind of stress it's facing and how much of that, that can be attributed to the fact that there is the requirement for long-term capital and what's available is short-term capital. Uh, you are absolutely right, Jeshwi. And um, I agree with Kuldeep uh, on his comment saying that this is a very important bill. It's been passed very quietly. Uh, if you were to quantify the benefit uh, what netting does is really free ups the capital. Uh, so about 40% of all contracts are nettable, uh, which means uh, on a holistic number, about two to three lakh crores of cash will be available to do more uh, financing uh, rather than providing for, right? That, that is what it does. Uh, 
you know, real estate, coming to real estate, I think it's a little bit more complicated. I think the whole bond market I, uh, from a real estate perspective is, is a must have, it's not an option. But where I think the sector is lagging is that the very fact that bond market has a big credit risk attached to it. And to ascertain the credit risk, you need rating to be done. And rating for bonds has to be at least A and above. Literally, if you were to count, uh, there are some 20,000 developers uh, plus, uh, there's no quantified number because there's no way to know how many developers there are. Uh, but less than 1%, even less than 0.5% may actually be uh, qualified with or without netting. So netting was not making that much difference to the sector, right? How many people will get uh, investable grade uh, rating is actually where the problem is. Mm -hmm. And that's not because, uh, you know, there is just issues around corporate governance, uh, which are well spoken, well talked about. So I'm not going to dwell on it. I think the sector is very complicated, uh, very fragmented. It is state-wise, city-wise, uh, micro-market-wise. What happens in South Bombay is different from what happens in suburbs of the same city. Uh, Ring Road, uh, Bangalore is different from central Bangalore. Uh, rules differ, permissions differ. So it's very difficult for somebody to aggregate and understand what's going on, right? And that's the challenge. It's not like a iron steel factory or, or a automobile industry. Uh, where you have a very clean assembly line, there's an input and output and you can measure literally everything uh, at any stage, at any time. Uh, unfortunately, real estate does not offer that. And it's still some time away. And it's not just India, by the way. So it's, it's globally, uh, we have very similar issues. Uh, that's one big challenge uh, between effective bond market in real estate uh, and its requirement, right? So two are really sort of different. Yes, the answer is yes, I need it, but can I can I afford to take it? Will lenders be uh, happy uh, giving us bonds? I think that's that's yet to be seen. Um, also, it is not at zero, by the way. So there are people who issued bonds both in residential and in commercial, more so in commercial, less in residential because commercial still. Um, easy to track, uh, it's more efficient use of capital. Uh, and that is why you see uh, even on the private side, uh, there are lots and lots, lots of transactions and, and REIT now that has happened, uh, two REITs have happened. One is in the pipeline and I saw your previous uh, webisode and you know you spoke about this. So I think, I think it's getting there. Uh, and I hope that we are able to do more uh, bond issuance uh, going forward. Yeah. Now I'll take you to the more important aspect and you're saying, what is the stress in real estate? I mean, that's a big question. Uh, if you look at the total pie, uh, what, what is termed as commercial real estate exposure, it's called CRE under the RBI guidelines. Uh, that is That includes all exposure to real estate by all financial institutions, uh, public, private, uh, now NBFCs are included. The total exposure is in excess of 7.2 lakh crores. Um, about 30% uh, to 35% of that is truly under commercial, which is offices. The balance is spread between retail and uh, residential and some bit of warehousing. Um, and given the state of the market, uh, real estate market, where prices have been declining, volumes have been going down pre-COVID, during COVID. Uh, in fact, after COVID, there's some reasons to celebrate, but uh, during COVID, it was obviously looking very bleak. Uh, my very broad guess is that what's under stress is between 15 to 18% of this overall pie. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are talking about plus minus one lakh crore, uh, which is under stress, uh, high stress, and that needs some sort of uh, uh, 
uh, examination it needs uh, it needs uh, attention uh, to say how do you refine that how do you save it uh, what do you do with it uh, because it's not just about bad loans it's about people's home not being delivered third party right being created and so on and so forth uh, so i think real estate has its own challenges having said that i'm still saying it's 15 18% so over 20% over 80% is good to go so it's not that bad huh? and and uh, before i come back to you kuldeep i, I do want to uh, ask ask you a few questions but i first want to go to veena veena when you talk about uh, the bonds market see the uh, the consumer the retail consumer gets into it to a fund manager right but uh, there is a there is a international funds that can come in pension funds long term funds uh, domestic international a lot of lot of participants in this entire market how prepared are we legally to handle this and in case of disputes are we are we ready to handle that in india i think uh, i think as, sure i think as an economy we have been ready to um you know welcome foreign investors in uh, in the bond markets and in this space specifically um i think mainly what is required is uh, is an fpi license and uh, then they can directly invest that is the main hindrance uh, which people find it as a hindrance but that is the only route which is permitted on a cross border basis for anybody to invest in the bond market in india now um a big relief that did come through is the entire uh, vrr or the voluntary retention route and um, you know while people were earlier skeptical uh, when the limits expired in december and uh, the route was closed in december and what will happen after that etc now those issues have been sorted um the vrr route is open it allows for investment freely the other conditions which came in on there needs to be two investors etc have have fallen through i think uh, for a committed investor which most of these investors are especially looking at india and what shobit mentioned in terms of just the volume that is there uh, for availability the interest rates that get charged uh, especially for real estate projects um for an investor see it as a very good opportunity to invest in india uh and therefore uh, the root of vrr has suddenly opened up a lot of interest by various type of investors um from countries which we had not even uh, seen people coming in and trying to invest and people are setting up fpis to specifically invest in india through the vrr route even equity investors who used to primarily look at pe investments are now looking at an fpi license so that they can invest in india and um, you know and look at it as an opportunity the only um, the only hindrance i see is uh, the general speculation with the real estate market right i mean when people look at the sector they look at it as a risky sector uh, rera has helped that a lot um, in terms of just getting comfort with the sector itself um but as far as uh, you know once the project evaluation stage is done uh, legally all those challenges are sort of uh, you know streamlined and people are able to look at it more positively uh uldi i'm going to come to you there are there are some things that have been allowed credit swaps currency swaps uh, swaptions netting now we clearly we prepared the ground uh, to a certain extent but even today india stamp duty rates are very high and does is that a deterrent do we need to fi- uh, fix this the short answer to your question is yes but i think you know there are wider if you ask me policy intervention that we perhaps need allow me to explain that uh vina referred to credit and i will and and you know shobit talked to a very interesting and valid point which is that hardly anybody qualifies i think some of that has history to it but i won't get into that on what has happened in the last two years in terms of what the regulators have done to make it much more difficult but let me just step back and give you the landscape if you look at the landscape of investors into the bond market and in general and perhaps real estate in particular you know i think there are four broad categories of which three are really relevant there are banks there are fpis there are mutual funds okay and there is the insurance and um uh, pension funds the reason i said three is because if you look at most fpis they are largely financial institutions or banks 
so I'm clubbing them under one kind of bucket, if you like. And just to put things in perspective, mutual funds in India between 2015 and 18 uh, started these credit funds, which went up to a peak of 1.6 lakh crore. In February this year, which is two, you know, one and a half years from the NBFC crisis, that figure had come down to one lakh crore. And then the meltdown started, you know, which is what Veena alluded to. Today, that figure is 25,000 crores. Now that money has not gone. The money has gone back into the equity or other types of mutual funds, right? The conundrum and challenge in India we have is that with the retail investor and the h &I investor you know, has, is, is investing in equity because of the tax arbitrage. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is more than one year, my equity investment doesn't have any tax. But if I want to make a secure investment in debt at eight, nine percent, I get taxed at 35, 40 percent. Right. So there is, there is that challenge there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but coming back to the point on the credit curve, I think we need to get to a situation where the issuers, you know, can move up the credit curve through credit enhancement and more than credit enhancement, because the default risk doesn't change on credit enhancement, for example, on pooling yeah. or on allowing leverage, yeah. right? And the capital providers, you know, need to be able to move down that credit curve, yeah. right? Yeah. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we don't have a junk bond market in India, but let's Keep that aside for a moment. Even a triple B plus or an A minus rating person cannot, you know, get an issuance done, right? Because of rating requirements, because of listing requirements. Now we can keep the rating and listing aside, you know, because that we can keep. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, we can, for example, have, you know, uh, two things. One, we need to recognize that global capital needs to come in. What do you need for that? If you just have India in the debt index globally, we'll get about $10 billion, right? So everybody who's interested, an index fund will be, you know, plus minus 3%. So between 2% to 8% money will automatically flow into India. A lot of this will come in through the FPI route, you know, like Mina mentioned, yeah. right? So that's a lot of money. Yeah. The second issue is how do we get domestic capital? Now we all know that insurance companies and uh, pension funds, you know, even if they allocate a small percentage of their capital, less than 5% to this sector, you know, that could enable a lot of money to come in. In the initial period, we should obviously make sure that this money is accessible only to well-governed, well-rated, well-managed businesses, yeah. right? But the objective of this is very simple, which is that you need to enhance liquidity into the system. The last bit is we need more market making. Market making can happen when you have better liquidity, right? So in summary, what I'm saying is, you know, um, with, with, you know, one category of, between the demand side and the supply side, you need to move up or down the credit curve, right? right? Now, the steps that have been taken are good, but for example, you know, we need to, to, and let me close this point by making two specific uh, recommendations on the international side. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know, there are some restrictions on the VRR, so on and so forth. We won't get into that in this forum, but if money is able to move in and out more quickly, you know, that will enable the flow. Yeah. The second is a most more simple thing, which is to do with settlements, right? If we move beyond domestic settlements at organizations such as NSDL and go into the EU or the clear stream, which are international settlements, I think you have a much bigger participation. Okay. The only caveat I would say, and this is something that the RBI has been, uh, to my mind, kind of grappling with, is that the moment you have Indian debt denominated in dollars or effectively in dollars, right? the currency risk increases. And in the case of a global meltdown, you know, given that we are very closely intertwined with the global economy, you know, you run that risk. But I think the balance can be found. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, Shubhik, 
uh, your wish list the four five things that need to be done and done now so that we can we can move towards this market yeah i mean today's focus is on bond market so so clearly i think what's easy to fix is uh, on uh, products that have rental stream uh, so for rent assets so these are both offices uh, partially retail and partially warehouses where you build to lease i mean those are easy to fix uh, as more and more assets are gravitating to reits um the bond market is finding its way into those uh, reits because credit rating is good these are well managed entities uh, black stones of the world are leading all of this uh, so so governance is extremely high uh, and hence that's that's going to happen second i think what can help and you know i'm not at the cost of reputation if some of what could be repeated or said is done then i think we'll have to readjust our borrowing borrowing prices or borrowing rates uh, in india i still think we are draconian uh, where developers uh, cost of borrowing is in excess of 15% uh, sometimes closer to 20 in many cases i think uh, most indian economy most developers uh, are bleeding because of that Yeah. Uh, so money is getting sucked out, uh, and we are almost uh, virtually working for the lenders uh, as a market, uh, and that's not even allowing the prices to soften. Because on one side, if my cost is up, I I can't figure out how you will give discounts uh, on the residential prices specifically, which is the government's long term objective. So if they allow a, a, a bond market. on the commercial side my guess is you'll automatically have more money freed up from regular banks uh, for residential till the appetite for bonds in the residential market also comes up that's a little bit away so in in terms of uh, immediate action i think uh, if we focus on office markets i think that's good enough uh, like i said like i said there will be a uh, there will be a positive effect even on the residential side uh veena uh, kuldeep jay shri jay shri my limit yeah my limited point just to add yeah add to what what uh, robert was saying i am kuldeep less no. worried about you i can't hear you very well the higher pricing i'm just saying let it be a market uh, can you hear me now yeah. am i audible now yes yes, yes. I, i'm say if this is better now what i'm saying is that the bond market mechanism right even if it is less efficient than the most desirable bond market mechanism enables a more market driven pricing yes. so the risk reward is priced right you know now to be fair insurance companies and you know pension funds need you know perhaps a better understanding of credit the mutual funds and banks and you know fpis have a better understanding of credit but the fact of the matter remains that a bond market enable efficient market driven relatively more transparent pricing okay okay uh veena when i when i look at the uh, residential market let's uh, uh, you know um, uh, shobit to uh, spoke about how it will uh, funds will be focused first on the commercial markets and the probably the warehousing market the the point is that the residential market is such a huge market with such a large requirement that there some kind of even while it waits in the wings to get into the bonds uh, get uh, bonds uh, funds it needs to, the clean up needs to start today if you look at the last 2 3 years the lending patterns have been all wrong you have lent on receivables you have lent on land you have lent on built up it's the whole package was all wrong i mean the lenders have not been very smart about it and today when rara rara after rara looks at it and says that you can't be the first lender has lent to assets that were never the developers at all he probably did not even know own the land so you you know that base level clean up needs to start would you like to comment on that yeah i i want to just make two points here uh, jashree one is that the way Uh, the reason why the real estate market is so different from other sectors is just by the way they are set up right now um, 
the entire model of having a whole co and having many spvs for various projects that is one thing having those spvs either housed in the same um, you know hold co or having them in separate entities that comes with its own risk the other part of it is um, this part where the land is probably not owned by um, by the company itself which is the reason why jdas exist and risk rewards under those agreements exist right now and these are not specific to the sector as a whole because real estate is still a state subject from a legal perspective each state has its own regulations when it comes to how um, how land is treated or or for that matter what is the stamp duty to be paid also right so um, that also governs some of these arrangements also if uh, in certain cases we have seen that the promoters are absolutely clear that the land will always remain with them it will be leased to the company and then there would be a lease back or a receivable arrangement or whatever like then there are multiple things that can happen um the bond market uh, you know opening up or for that matter the netting certainty that has coming uh, with this legislation i don't think that is going to change the grass root of how uh, how lending has taken place in this uh, in this market right because at the end of the day the the real estate developers and the promoters are going to always continue um, you know setting up these entities in this manner on the other hand when it comes now when we look at it from the lenders perspective um they are actually indifferent as long as the security package is uh, is fairly strong um you know if if there is certainty of the money coming in then the credit risk is is taken care of yes there are challenges on how you will enforce it especially with the third party security etc but at the end of the day for a new real estate project the only thing that's there is receivables and the land and if you don't own the land what are you giving as security um with respect to bonds itself also for it to be listed there has to be security cover there has to be asset cover being maintained etc those are additional um, requirements which obviously has a capital cost associated to it what the legislation does and uh, kulgeet mentioned this when when we started it frees up capital and the amount of capital that has got freed up for the bank see this is one of the uh, unintended consequences of this legislation right because um, being a derivatives lawyer in my early days as a lawyer uh, you know i have seen this uh, this issue being debated for the last 16 17 years quite quite aggressively at different forums everybody looked at it as a um, you know as a netting relief and getting a capital relief nobody thought of it as to what are you going to do with all that capital that you are that you are getting saved right with this so this is one of the classic situations where um, there has been a positive impact of a legislation which nobody intended and now obviously that is leading to opportunities um and this this sector and this market is probably best positioned to um you know utilize this opportunity because that is actually the need of the hour um when it comes to the uh, you know to answer your question when it comes to the retail assets or residential assets um at least in the last maybe a year um i have at least in our experience we have seen that people are more comfortable with the um with the residential assets as opposed to commercial assets also uh, or because they feel that especially for partly constructed projects because the general belief is that um, you know people like you and me are uh, are not really uh, going to default and uh, probably will continue to pay our loans and you we look at i mean uh, it's not so much relevant now but in pre covid when uh, dhfl went into insolvency and they put their assets up in insolvency under three different buckets most of the investors were interested in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, you know in the retail assets or in the residential property because people knew that that is something which which will probably fetch them better money than an sra project or any other wholesale loan which has which had been extended by them so uh issue with when you when you look at the real estate developers the industry one of the biggest issues that have been raised here time and again on my shows is that there is no formal finance available to buy land 
which is why you have these uh, joint development agreements and so on, which uh, when it sours, it sours badly and you've seen in numerous problems in the marketplace. What, what is that risk associated with funding land? And uh, do you think that something needs to be done there? Yeah, uh, so let me just sort of rewind a little bit and you did in your last question, the title mentioned about grassroots lending being wrong or the underwriting not being very good. Actually, uh, it, it may be a little bit out of context because it's not that our bankers or fund managers have done a wrong job. Yeah. Uh, essentially, until 2013, literally from the, from the inception, and SDFC was amongst the first uh, sort of uh, lender to real estate in 1992. Uh, real estate in general has been an appreciating asset class. If you did nothing, your land would go up in price, go keep going up every year, keep going up every year. Uh, so your security was getting enhanced and therefore nobody was really worried. Uh, everybody knew it saying what I'm sort of lending against today as 2x security will probably be 2.5 or three uh, at the time of maturity. Uh, since 2013, uh, prices have stopped climbing in many cities, many situations, they've even gone down. And that's where the erosion of uh, what you call as loan to security or security covers has been, right? So that's been a big problem. Second, uh, roughly similar time, uh, that's post the last financial crisis, uh, RBI came up saying, uh, we don't want banks to do land funding. And the reason for them to do this was, A, they didn't want a sort of asset bubble to build up right, where it was quite easy to finance land. Uh, I think what they figured at that point is because we do not have title insurance and our land title is extremely fragmented, uh, it's very, very tough to finance land. And once you finance land, it inf the, the value of free and marketable title in, in India is, is, is immense. Uh, so many securities got uh, sort of destroyed uh, in that downturn. And that's when banks realize it's not their cup of tea uh, to just finance simple land. Uh, and banks have shied away. I think over time, this has improved. Uh, the industry has gone back, uh, has made separate, several representation saying, please allow uh, some amount of, uh, of uh, land financing. I think this was one reason. And the other one was that Typically, land seller, owner of the land, was was always expecting uh, payments both uh, off balance sheet and in balance sheet. So obviously, the government was very, really, really uh, not happy with uh, with the land the way it was being valued. So I think all of that has gone away. I think uh, now markets are more mature. Uh, real estate sector has become more formal. Uh, there are many listed players that are doing extremely well. Uh, they are also very good private uh, families, family office run businesses that have been very successful. And uh, last and not the least from 2005, since FDI was allowed, uh, lots of external private equities supported by pension funds, sovereign funds have come and at least educated our markets on what the right governance model should be, how things should work. I think we are now ready to receive uh, more bond money. Uh, uh, I'm sure Veena will agree she's done enough contracts to say this will, this will start to work. So perhaps government has got it right from a timing perspective. Mm -hmm. I think uh, more work needs to be done on ground from the sector perspective. Uh, to make it qualified for this. So now we know there's enough cash. Now we just need to qualify for it. Uh, Kuldeep, we have this focus on, if you look at what, uh, what's happening with the REITs, you, uh, they can invest only in grade A premium office fees with a certain amount of rental uh, returns and so on. But as India urbanizes from 35% to 50%, there is a huge opportunity in land, in residential, in in infrastructure and services, uh, municipal services as well. So are these, are these uh, areas where we will test it? 
Uh, sorry, I, I, I missed your last point. Are these areas where bonds would be interested in investing and what kind of returns can they expect? So I think there are two parts to this. Part one is that, you know, um, we need to separate um, assets that generate yield type of relatively more predictable, you know, lesser returns, but much more stable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think apart from warehousing, you know, um, uh, offices, so on and so forth, even to a smaller extent, data centers, so on and so forth, right? There are other asset classes, right? Residential included. When you talk of infrastructure and services, I think, you know, it depends on what we're talking about, but essentially when you have infrastructure, infrastructure is more like a long-term bond, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so there are, there is the possibility of, of you doing that. I think, yes, the short answer is, you know, it will attract capital. The question will be the risk reward. There might be different sets of investors, right? But my sense is the best way to do it is to do it in three steps. Step one, you release capital, mm -hmm. right? With diversified businesses, releasing capital that is currently blocked in rent yielding more stable assets and redeploying that, right? There are other forms in which we've talked about today about capital getting released that will also come, right? The second thing, okay, is that you start to allow pooling, right? Now that pooling can be done in multiple ways. We've already seen uh, two large Indian developers in the last three months, oh, sorry, one large Indian developer in the last three months, taking some form of inventory and some less predictable and pooling it together and going out and raising a bond, right? We also have another example of a very large, well-respected listed corporate who's gone on the same, on their balance sheet and done it. I think the latter is, you know, a lot, lot more difficult and, and there will be few and far between, but I think there is a growing number. The third, I think is, and this will take a little bit of time, might take a year, you know, maybe a little bit more as well, because the current uh, yield spread between a triple A and a double A and an A has widened significantly. Just to put things in perspective, a triple A is between five and 5.2, a double A today, okay, I'm talking non-real estate, okay, is at 8%. That 3% spread used to be at worst 1.2 to 1.5 earlier. So I think as confidence returns to the market, you know, you will have much, much more of this capital come back voluntarily, you know. Uh, so so the, the point in summary that I'm trying to make is twofold. Number one, we need to have enabling provisions, okay, from for foreign and domestic capital to come in, right? The second thing, okay, is for a structural change to get accelerated in the non-yield, rent yielding or stable asset yielding. This thing. And I think consolidation will help that, right? Um, the last but not the least, I think we also need to have some element of leverage that needs to get allowed, right? The point I'm trying to make is if you're only making a seven, eight percent or 9% on stable assets, and I can't leverage that, then both from a retail and, a, and, and an ultra HNI perspective, which is basically domestic money, right? You will not see money come back into the debt mutual funds. You know, the point I'm trying to make is if I look at it at myself as a retail investor, okay, as an example, right? I have four essential asset class choices, equity type funds, debt type funds, you know, direct real estate and gold. The latter two are a matter of personal choice. But when I have to choose between the first two, you know, given the way the tax structure works in India, you know, people gyrate towards towards equity, right? Um, That's because so, the policy has pushed us towards equity, right? It makes I agree with you. The point I'm trying to make is that at, at the risk of being brutal, the risk reward curve in India mm -hmm. is skewed by tax. Yes, absolutely. I fully you know? endorse that. So that the reason why I'm saying we need to solve the domestic problem is because in the next maybe one, two, three, five years, you can depend on global capital, right? But that carries risks with it. If I were to look at this from a 10-year perspective, right? And we're running a marathon, not a 100-meter dash in our, in our business. You know, we need to have much more stable and alternate sources of capital, which will essentially need to come from the domestic uh, capital sources whether retail or institutional. Uh, Veena, uh, one of the things that we need to fix is our land titling. 
and land insurance, land title insurance, right? Uh, if you, the, there has been a lot of uh, talk about digitizing. Some states have got their uh, rudimentary pieces, right? But even when we digitize, we are only digitizing the existing record. We haven't, there's no element of guarantee that this, this title is correct. It's just that it has been digitized. So it's easier to uh, challenge it. Uh, where are we in this entire digitization process and how important is that to get this market? Uh, I think uh, in the last couple of years, the number of startups who have come up in this space, specifically in the space of digitizing uh, real estate across the country is amazing. And, um, you know, some of these, like I, I very closely advise one of the entities on, on, uh, on just legal aspects, but when I look at what they are doing and when I look at their reports and see what the competitors are doing, it is actually quite amazing to, uh, to see how much of an opportunity there is in digitizing of real estate records. Like I remember one of the other entities was talking about um, just enter the name of the building and I can show you what was the last sale of that property in that building and uh, you know how much was paid, when was it done, etc. So um, there is a lot of work happening uh, and it is it is quite interesting to see that it is being taken, um, it, it is being treated as an opportunity because startups usually look uh, at the at the space where there can be a return because at the end of the day, they are also looking at investors at some point of time who will look at the viability and feasibility of a project. So um, on digitization, I think we are way, way ahead. On title insurance, it's uh, it's tricky. Um, I think there has been a lot of movement in uh, a lot of movement in some states, but absolutely no movement in a lot of states. So uh, that's going to be a tricky aspect. Uh, I don't, uh, from a legal solution perspective, um, I don't really see much of a uh, much of a change happening in the short term. Um, and those would always be issues uh, for more for a foreign investor than for a domestic investor because of just the, uh, it's not that they don't understand, it's just about the risk appetite for uh, dealing with such projects or dealing with this risk or for that matter, putting a value to that risk. That is where uh, people struggle. Uh, because even if you can appreciate what the risk is with lack of title insurance, uh, with lack of title or not a clear title, etc., you still need to be able to uh, to put a value to it. And I think that's where uh, that's where investors will will struggle. Um, also, the litigation risk, right? I mean, especially now with this entire um, with with insolvency code coming in. You know, we had cases in the initial days where. There were discussions around uh, whether a real estate project can be taken into insolvency, especially at an SPV level, etc. Now that all of that is settled, and now that uh, you know there is comfort from an investor perspective that these can actually go into insolvency and there can be a resolution, which I mean it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But when we look at uh, you know having reached that situation. People are still not able to, um, you know, look at the issues and put a value to it. For example, when we do legal diligence, we are asked to, um, you know, put two things that I struggle on real estate diligence is, is where people ask us to put a probability of success in litigation, uh, especially on land and real estate issues. And the second thing is classifying the risk as low, medium, high, right? I mean, you can always classify the risk as, I mean, the objective is not to keep too much as high if you want the deal to go through. Um, and uh, how do you quantify it? Because when we are talking about a litigation risk, uh, in today's world, uh, people are litigious. And in India specifically, even if you may not get the result that you want from the litigation, what you may probably get is the delay. And how do you quantify that? So there are no answers to this. And I think uh, I think while we will reach uh, somewhere on digitization, I don't think we will reach too far on title insurance in a manner that investors or uh, all cl classes of investors will get comfort. I think we are far from that. What does it take to uh, push us in that direction? I think two things. One is discipline. Uh, and when I say discipline, it's about the discipline at the, at the ground level by the proponents 
and two is transparency because today this sector we have reached this stage or we need it why did we need a rera right i mean rera is not talking about something which uh, you know when we read the legislation it talks about certain basic things i mean obviously if you leave the entire bit on um, you know escrow and all of that when you look at it it has done it has done only two things it has brought in transparency and it has uh, provided people the comfort that uh, and it has provided discipline because if i commit to something i need to deliver on that so i think um, you know it it is some time that this continues and once it settles probably we will see a change um i'm going to uh, before i ask uh, more questions i'm going to pick up some of the comments that are coming or any of you is welcome to uh, address them these are uh, some of them are rants but i think the rants are also they, there is a glimmer of truth in the rant and we i would like you guys to comment on it there is uh, vikram jetwani who has said except a few players the sector is marred by unprofessional builders who enter the housing sector with the sole purpose of making money with no experience skills and intention to serve home buyers it it is good that banks don't lend to these corporates else it would be rot the banking sector would be rotten too now uh, this is the general perception when it comes to the residential sector uh, there is another gentleman i think mr bhat badrinath bhat who says the real stress in the real estate sector uh, real estate is done by builders they collect money from buyers bought huge chunks of land for future pro, uh, future projects and kept present projects incomplete these builders should be grilled let's leave out the uh, the uh, this thing about what we should do to the builders i think both of them have raised important issues one is that the receivables that came from the consumers was meant to be uh, used to complete the project and there was enough in the project for them to have made their money but at that point of time it was it was the norm to keep buying more and more land and we have seen there were three or four years of intense buying across uh, urban india is this something that has been controlled is this something that that will be i mean escrow accounting make sure that some money comes into the money comes into building the assets but this this appetite for more and more uh, uh, land parcels is this uh, was this at the bottom of all this problem i'll try and make one comment from a legal perspective on this which is that um, you know before the insolvency code came in um it was even difficult uh, especially for stress in the account it was even difficult to get um, get face time with the with the borrower once they had defaulted i remember some of the borrowers even in the real estate sector after they had defaulted we wanted to go for restructuring discussions the lenders would they would make the lenders sit for hours even before they started negotiating with us with the threat of insolvency that has changed significantly with covid that has changed further because now you would see borrowers who are approaching the lenders proactively to have their accounts restructured because they want to take the benefit of all the reliefs that the government is providing or for that matter rbi is providing so there has been especially in the last 3 4 years there has been a significant shift in the in in behavior of the borrower itself and obviously for the good so i think at least from a legal perspective that is something that i just wanted to highlight uh, i think shobit wanted to say something yeah i wanted to say something i said it's it's nice uh, you know i'm not surprised at these comments yeah. uh, you know uh, jayshree uh, i think that's the perception uh, of developers but uh, i would like to sort of bad for them they're not on this call uh, not all of them are like this uh, they're host of very good developers especially in the south uh they've done great work uh, they've delivered on time before time i think this uh, sort of land banking mania uh, got over many years ago uh, because the prices stopped to climb and i think to take care of the sort of uh, grouse that you're getting on whatever you are reading i think that's the whole intent of rera right to come in and i think government has realized it government has addressed it uh, and the proof of all of this is uh, literally we work uh, in many states i think almost 20 states that we are working any state that has done good adoption of era led by maharashtra 
you've seen that real estate has bounced back much faster than everything else i'm not saying that it's it's a happy situation uh, but whether it's the maharashtra government haryana government up government you see they are they are following it in spirit uh, i think there is a bounce back uh, of both the buyer confidence which is the home buyer as well as the investor conf- uh, confidence right so yes this was a problem that is why regulators brought in a regulators doing a very good job uh, most states are trying to follow it uh, some are lagging some are not lagging uh, that's there uh and the mania for land is is somewhat over i mean if you look at some of the listed companies without naming them they haven't bought a new piece of land for multiple years now but by right. your admission the markets are subdued the land markets are subdued that is why they are not buying right the land markets will again bounce back will what what safeguards do you need so because that, now now that, rera is there now oh, rera is there so your escrow accounts are extremely strict uh the enforcement of rera is very strict uh both the buyer and the banker and everybody else is much more conscious of their rights and of course with help of people like veena i think these contracts are now administered much faster so there is a full records i mean she was herself narrating how 10 years ago people would not care about uh, what they had signed Uh, and would keep the bankers waiting i dare say that anybody can do it now i mean uh, i think there's a instant karma that will catch up with you you try doing that with a banker today god help you yeah you know uh, i don't think uh, and the full administration is supporting right you, you know it's not just uh, it's not just the banks and the courts uh, all kinds of um, enforcement directorates siof this that and the others the the government just unleashes everything on you you can't be cute about these things anymore uh, and i think people have their own self respect i think you know if they've got into a difficult situation uh, they try and resolve it uh, otherwise we have the we have the judiciary to do it um and kuldeep you've been on both sides right you you've been a lender uh, and you you are now with uh, the developer so between the two what have you seen change the equation between the lender and the developer there's the three things you know number one so, so so firstly to support the point that i think either shobhit or veena made you can't paint everything yeah. or everybody with one brush across industry it's not just to do with real estate that said i think there are there are two things one uh, there's obviously a category of well organized well established well meaning you know um developers who are seeing an opportunity to be much more disciplined with their capital allocation to be better to to leverage their governance yeah. to leverage their customer centricity and to to kind of because they were already already following more or less the norms of rera so it was very easy for them to kind of you know slip into what was the current regulation and to comply with it and take advantage of it right so they are seeing the opportunity the other thing which i think is very important to appreciate is that it's not just the land pricing which is kind of stopped appreciation the margins in the industry have not been that high right so the fact of the matter is that you know when the margins shrink you have to start looking at efficiency and it's only a very small set of people who are able to get that efficiency and one of the things their realization has been which is true of all developers right and certainly the more organized ones is that they have recognized that land is a raw material right and that there is no benefit in holding it because there is a cost to holding it i'm saying even if the price is going up in a micro market there is a cost to holding it now if i were to step back and look at what the capital providing community has done the capital providing community has also stopped funding land whether it is by regulation where the banks can't do it or by choice where the nbfcs and eifs have said listen this is fine right i will allow you to buy land but listen please what is the condition it's a default condition that you have to develop the land within a certain time frame i'm not just going to lend you and tell you okay that for the next 5 years don't develop the land sorry that doesn't yeah. work so the game has changed right the game has the rules changed. of the game have changed yeah the other thing i think that's important is that 
the the developers who see this opportunity of gaining market share and building it into an industry have not only read the writing on the wall but they keep looking at the mirror so so what i'm trying to say today is that if you look at and, and because data on listed developers is easy to come by therefore i'm referring to it you look at even during the last two quarters from the data that is available organized players are growing market might be shrinking which means that the consolidation is gathering pace now the markets will 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 beat you up if you go and start buying land again you know as and when the prices right rise right lenders will not give you money capital providers will not back you right and even good well meaning see the important point is your intention may have been right but if your ability was weakened because your land was dragging you down you know then people like veena were making sure that you know you saw the right people and went to the right places right uh veena uh, uh, one of the, i'm going to bring the discussion back to bonds uh one of the suggestions was that we must allow investment in subprime or junk bonds because the return it's not that you put all your uh, money into junk bonds but even if you put 1 or 2% into junk bonds which yield 13 14% allow th those lenders who are lending to the uh non institutional uh, you know the uh, the base of the pyramid allow them also to create bonds and allow investment in that what is your view on that vina i think we we've lost uh, i'm back you... i'm back sorry oh, okay great uh did you hear the question or you want me to repeat no i i heard till you said that uh, you know the till you mentioned the 13 uh, the 13 14% interest that can be earned on the junk bonds yes uh what is your view on this for a robust bonds market do we need uh, uh, to allow investment in the subprime bonds junk bonds i think it's a demand supply issue it's more of a commercial risk than a legal issue as such see the legal issue comes in from a uh, from a rating ability or from the perspective of listing ability and that's where there are some challenges but in the unlisted bond market or uh, as a specific um, you know stream as such there are no um, there are no red flags as such but uh, and especially now where uh, there are distressed players who have looked at india who have got comfortable with india uh, whether it is because of ipc or generally just because of the opportunities that have been there for the last 5 6 years i think um, probably the time is right to introduce this as uh, as a specific uh, uh, as a specific measure itself something to this effect was done in the context of uh, ecbs for foreign players um, but for indian players as such or for the fpi entities there is nothing similar and that's where the challenge comes in uh, shobhit what are your views on this and i'll put an additional question here do you see uh, will nbfcs benefit from uh the bonds market uh, definitely i think it's a it's a new source of capital uh, they can definitely raise uh, given their credit uh, history uh, they will have the ability to raise bonds at much sharper prices they already are by the way uh, mm -hmm. so it's not that they're not doing this so uh, so the nbfcs can raise bonds and then sort of invest it downstream downstream it to real estate uh and perhaps on some arbitrage i mean that's the model anyways that they use uh so overall overall uh, you know uh, just sort of uh, probably say a last few uh it is not a good to have it's a must to have uh right but uh, but we have to get there uh, maybe it should start with nbfcs uh, raising bonds and then uh, with their expertise lending it uh, or underwriting real estate projects and uh, you know uh, junk bond like you mentioned or vina mentioned is the appetite of the investor to underwrite the risk uh, you know people sell junk bonds as junk bonds so you know at the time of buying junk bond that you buying a high risk paper uh, so it's a greed versus uh, safety right you you buy some things for high cost if you think that's a bet that you take so that's fine absolutely I, i mean it's going to be market driven you can't say that junk bonds need to be introduced i think they'll automatically get there 
once the appetite builds up right that's what i'd like to say thank you and uh, kuldeep there's a question that has come from bm besali who says the it sector is a large consumer of commercial space and has been in the wait and watch mood what will be the impact on this sector considering many businesses have shut down operations do you do you see a stress in the commercial sector coming up and uh, how does that impact the coming in of the bond market So I think that 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 two 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 parts. Let's just step back and you know look at it, look at it. You know I won't get into each micro market, but I think there are. If you look at it in general, the large, well organized multinationals, large Indian corporates, you know, tech and IT industry in general are growing, right? Yeah. I think if you'd asked me the same question three or four months ago, my answer may have been you know wait for a quarter. But I think now the trends are much more. uh kind of visible uh, the large it indian majors have not only announced uh, hiring net hiring okay but also wage increases right so i think i think uh, and and that's been across the board so i think uh, what will happen in the short term okay may be very different so for example i may have grown my people i may not grow my space right but there are many there are a few instances including in bangalore where rents have actually gone up so i don't think we can kind of you know um you know uh, paint everything with that one brush yeah. right that said right that said um the ability of the bond market to benefit you know uh, this sector will come largely from the the land owners you know uh, being able to take the benefit right of being able to offload their assets right and be able to free up capital that is then available for them to either solve issues that they may be facing in other parts of the business or to finance something that they may have been they may have committed to right um but if if there is one little dark cloud it's the fact that you won't see the runaway rent increases you know that were happening right um the other bit which is more to do with foreign players is the fact that they typically look at a dollar a square foot a month as round about the cap given that the indian rupee has not depreciated significantly you know against the dollar that might be the other thing that you know needs to be borne in mind you know because they typically look at you know dollar pricing you know both on their cost as well as on their revenue uh veena I, i i have a hundred more questions to ask but i think i'll have to stop here but veena one last question that has come does rera have legal provisions to help the uh, in arrangement of funds for real estate are there any uh, rera provisions that allow help uh, helping funds to come in um uh, not i mean it allows uh, developers should raise money uh, and give collateral so comfort from a collateral perspective but otherwise raising money is uh, basically on the lender the regulations apply to the lender not so much to the borrower uh could you want to say something i, I felt you did no 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 okay. no, 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 no fine this is where i'm going to uh, call, uh, bring the discussion to a close thank you so much for joining me this is an issue that needs to be raised this is an issue that needs to be debated and i think this was one of the best debates i heard in recent times about why the indian market is ready for funds thank you so much for joining the property issue i'm jashree thank you thank you jashree thank you thank you everybody